All right, well, part number three of winning the war in your mind. I don't know about you, but this has been a really um, deep sermon series, fun, uh, but at the same time, really challenging because we're talking about how the mind is a battlefield. And I would say this, just to start off, um, most of us, uh, we have a pretty decent life. In other words, we have food to eat every day. We have some, most of us have cars to drive in. We have work, uh, we're employed. Um, and so we, we, for the most part, have what we need to live life. But for some reason, we still find things to complain about, right? You can have everything. You could have your internet at home, your, your smartphone, your job, your car, your two cars, right? Your cars might even have houses called garages, and you still yet find something to complain about. And what we've been talking about is this idea that the mind is a battlefield, and most of life's battles are won and or lost in the mind, And so we've said a few things that I want to repeat and remind you that the life you live is often a reflection of the thoughts that you think. The life that you live is often a reflection of the thoughts that you think. In other words, what comes into your mind comes out of your life, right? You cannot have a positive life if you have a negative mind. And I want to read a scripture that we've read before during this series, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. And scripture says this, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight are not the weapons, are not with the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive, there's the key thought there, every thought and make it obedient to Christ. We take captive our thoughts and we make them obedient to Christ. The title of today's message is simply this, Defeat Your Negative Thoughts. Defeating Your Negative Thoughts. Um, We've been talking about this and we've been showing you this cool little vil, uh, video illustration about the neural pathways in the brain and this idea that the more you think about things, the more uh, uh, the pathways go. And go ahead and show that video right there. The more that you think about these things, um, the negative things, the easier it is to go down that same path, right? The easier it is to, to think negative. If you think negative, it's easier for you to default to negative. If you think positive, it's easier for you to think positive, right? It's creating that path. We've said it every week so far that when you uh, walk through a field um, and you keep walking the same path, at at, at some point, that grass or those weeds are going to become dirt and that path is going to become pretty easy to follow because it's the path that you keep taking. And so your pathways (laughs) uh, become easier to follow. And what we want to do is we want to create new pathways. We want to create positive pathways. We want to create godly pathways is what we want to do. Now, I want to introduce a couple of other thoughts today as we move through this idea of defeating your negative thoughts and winning the war in your mind. Two things, your cognitive bias, biases. We're going to talk about cognitive biases and mental filters. Now, let's talk about cognitive biases first. The definition of a cognitive bias is this. Mistake in reasoning based on personal experiences or preferences. Now, we all know what a bias is, right? A bias is like if your your son tried out for American Idol and, and, and somebody else that sang really, really, really good tried out next to him and your son isn't so great, but your bias is, I think he's the better singer, right? Um, no, that's just your bias because he's your son, right? Now, a cognitive bias, again, the definition is there to make a mistake in reasoning based on your personal experiences or your preferences, right? So in other words, um, for some of you, if you grew up uh, uh, around abusive men, then you may have a hard time trusting men, right? You might think that all men are bad, right? Um, If you... um, 
grew up and your parents said, oh, rich people are snobs and rich people are, are, are bad people, uh, you may feel guilty if you start to succeed or you start to uh, uh, have some success in life and, and make some money, or you might feel uh, indifferent towards those who do have money because your parents always told you that and you have this cognitive bias, in other words. So, so the, your cognitive bias, we're talking about that. And then the filters, filters that you have shape how you see life and, and filters in our day and age are all so popular because we all use them on our camera. Sometimes people, sometimes your, your Facebook profile does not look like you just to, just to put it out there. You, you filter, filter, filter. And the, the, the other day I didn't realize that Zoom had a filter and, and I was doing a, a Zoom call, some training. And, and I said, oh, I could, I could smooth out my face a little bit with this filter. And I was like, better, better, better fake. All right, go back to better, right? Because uh, you could really uh, filter yourself out and some of us just go way too far. But we all know what a filter is. We were taking pictures uh, in, for Christmas. We were taking our own photo shoot because we were in quarantine, right, for last year, 2020. And this is what the photo looked like before the filter. We have this big green screen that I record some of my cycling videos at home with, and we all just sat in front of the camera and hit the button, and it took a picture of us with a green screen, right? Now, that doesn't look like a great Christmas card, but when you put a filter on it, let me magically do this, boom, right? Look at that. <laughs> it looks beautiful. We just took away the green, all the ugly, gooey, throw up mess in the background and put a beautiful landscape, and we all know what a filter is. And so the fact is, aren't, the fact is we took a photo, but the filter is different. And the, the thing with cognitive biases, and it, it's a default filter, if you will. It's a pre-wire way to interpret uh, something that you have some kind of experience with, okay? And, and so you're, it's why two people can respond differently to the same situation. So for example, um, the facts are the same, but the filter is different. So we could say, if somebody gave you uh, constructive feedback, somebody came in and said, hey, I, I like what you did here. Uh, maybe your voice tone could change there, or maybe your grammar could be you know, improved here, or your writing style can, you know, whatever. You might be upset. One person might be like, ah, you know, I'm offended. Like I did my best. I worked my hardest at that. And then the other, another person with the same information, the same exact feedback might say, wow, I'm, I'm really thankful that you gave me that positive feedback. That's super helpful for me. Or somebody might walk into church, right? And they might walk in there and they have a bad experience with church. And they're like, ah, these people are singing, but they're a bunch of hypocrites. They're no better than anybody else. And then the same person could walk into the same church, the same experience with the same worship song and the same pastor, the same bald guy, right? And they'll say, oh, I really felt God's presence. Again, the facts didn't change. It's the filter that was different. Or you might read some uh, news sources, right? The news sources that say uh, the vaccine is the answer, right? And everybody, we can't wait for the vaccine. We can't wait. And then some, some sources and some filters might lead you to believe, right? That the vaccine is going to kill you, right? And they're going to inject something in you and put a chip in you and it's the end of the world, right? So <laughs> that's dangerous to talk about that. But that is the filters that we have based on the information that we receive, okay? Um, in the book of Numbers, chapter 13 and 14, Moses, he sends out 12 spies to explore the land, if you remember the story. And what happens is that 10 out of the 12 that came, 10 of them were like, no way, this is, this is, <laughs> this is not what, what is, we're not going to do this. That land is full of giants. We're like grasshoppers. We're going to get defeated. They're going to kill us. But two of them, um, they were saying, it's great. It's beautiful. Let's go take the land. We can do it, right? So it was like two out of the 10. The situation was the same. Tw all 12 saw the same scenery, the same land, the same place that Moses sent them to, but two of them had a different response. Ten of them had a negative response, and that is uh, what happened. Now, again, the facts aren't different. It's the filter. It's not just the filter, too, and let's, let's keep moving. Let's build on this. It's, let's build on this. It's not just the filter. It's also the way you frame something. So the situation that could be the same, but how you frame it determines how 
you see it, okay? Um, so let's identify and let's, let's um, there, there's this tool that, uh, that uh, people um, that help others with mental uh, distress and, and different types of trauma that they use, and it's just called the reframing tool. And let's put a definition on reframing. It's this. It's creating a different way of looking at a situation or relationship by changing its meaning, right? So the situation's the same. The people around you are the same. The environment is the same, but you're creating a different way of looking at the situation or relationship by changing its meaning. meaning. So, so your day could look like this. I have a photo of, of, of a day here. Your day may look like this. Like there's a rainbow, right? There is um, some clouds. There's the landscape there. And let's say that you had a challenging day, right? You had a challenging day ahead of you and your day consisted of um, a lot of meetings or you had to meet with somebody that you didn't get along with or it was just, you knew it was gonna be a hard day. You knew it was a high traffic day when you came and you might think to yourself, and, and this is the frame, this first frame, you might put it in a dark cloud and you might say this, oh, today's gonna be horrible. I'm not looking forward to driving through traffic. It's supposed to snow, right? And I have to have a meeting with the person that I really don't like. It's, it's just horrible, it's horrible. And then I'm not gonna get home till late and I'm going to miss my favorite show or okay that's one way to frame it or you could frame it like this you could say you know what today's going to be a great day I know traffic is going to be heavy but I'm going to put on my favorite sermon my favorite podcast and really just soak in some time with God right I'm going to try to mend the relationship with the person that I'm been having a difficult time with and I'm going to enjoy the rest of it. It's not going to be easy, but I'm going to make the best of it, right? You see the difference? You could frame it up here back in the negative in that cloud, right? You could say things are going to be bad. Things are going to be bad. Or you could go back over and frame it into, I feel like there's a rainbow going to happen today, right? Um, it's all on how you frame it. It's all on how, what you do with it, how you see it. You can't control, again, what happens to you, but you can control how you frame it. You can control how you frame it. Um, if you've ever met, uh, if you have, a, if those of you who have a grandparent that's just extremely, like, positive, right? Uh, the world is falling apart, and your grandma is saying, God's in control, right? And you're like, yeah, but this is, this is not going to work. And God's in control. Yeah, but my marriage is falling apart. God's in control. Yeah, but I just left my job, lost my job. And they're like, it's okay, son. God is in control. He's going to take, and they're just, there's no way of talking them out because they, their neural pathways are, are so strong towards believing that God is in control, reframing the bad situation into a positive situation, that there's nothing you can do to change their mind that God is in control. Can I get an amen for that, right? That God is in control. And it's how we frame it. Uh, because, again, you, you can't control what happens, but you can control how you frame it. Uh, if you've ever wanted something in life, something bad, it really like the job and, and, and the, the marriage and the family, but you experience the opposite, uh, what do we do with that? You know, what do we do with it? You, you worked hard, you, you earned the degree, but you didn't get the job that you were overqualified for. Like, what do you, what do, you do with that, right? You dreamed to have a great marriage. Um, you, you wanted to marry your sweetheart, but then you end up divorced later, okay? Or, or, or you're, this, is, uh, this is the point of, what's the point of life, right? Or this is the point I always wanted in life to be happy, to be, you know, uh, to live and have whatever I need and, and then some. And it just doesn't work out that way. It didn't work out that way. You have all these dreams. Many of you can identify this. In fact, Paul in the Bible can identify with having these dreams, having this vision to, to, to preach the gospel, to plant churches everywhere. But it didn't always go the way that Paul um, wanted it to go. And so if you remember, um, Paul, he dreamed to go to Rome and to preach, and he ended up being a prisoner. And Paul, 
He could have framed this. Now, he ended up in prison, right? Instead of being, uh, doing what he's passionate about, he ended up in prison. And there's a scripture that I'm going to read in Philippians 1, 12 through 13 that describes his negative situation. And, and I want to point out, I'm going to read two different versions here just to give you some, uh, some, a little bit of, of, of perspective, okay? This first version is the new Weiner's version of the Bible, I don't know if you've heard of this version, but it goes like this. Paul, here is one way he could have framed his situation being in prison. He said, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me really sucks, right? (laughs) And as a result of the hell I've been through, I'm quitting Eternal Rock Church. I'm quitting Eternal Rock and never going back to church, right? Now, Now, if you're new to church, that is not a real real translation of the Bible. That is just the Weiner's version. That's how he could have framed it, right? That's how some of us think. Here's how he did frame it though. Here's the real version. (laughs) The real version goes like this. And now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, again, him being in prison, has actually served to advance the gospel. And as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Like, so what, what most people think is bad, he is framing as good. Like, I'm in prison, but you know what? It's actually served to be a better situation. Um, I'm chained to guards for up to eight hours at a time, and guess who I get to preach the gospel to? This guy that can't leave me, <laughs> the guy that has to stay next to me. And I am getting to share the gospel. And then in Philippians 1, 4, he says, and because of my chains, check this out, and because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. In other words, they were worried about Paul. They didn't know what was going to happen to Paul. Paul said, I'm preaching the gospel in here. And they heard about it. And they're like, oh my God, like my faith is is encouraged as a result of what Paul is, what's Paul, his response to his situation, Paul's response to his situation. And so it's how we frame it. So I want to give you three quick little bullet points on how to reframe your story and relationships. The first one is this, thank God for what didn't happen. Thank God for what didn't happen. We should have a, a, a bullet point there to thank God for what didn't happen. Here's a story that I want to share with you. Uh, again, how you frame it. <laughs> thank God for what didn't happen. There was a girl who uh, told her parents, um, she, she went away to college and she came home to visit. She told her parents, hey, uh, I, I, got, I got some just crazy news. I need to sit down and talk to you. I met a guy at a bar one night, you know, I was stressed out from homework and, and we, we drank and, and, and we went home together and I ended up getting pregnant. Um, and, and I didn't realize that he was on probation and, uh, it's going to be another year before he can do anything. And he said he would start looking for a job after he got out of probation and, and went through rehab and he said he would consider marrying me, but we, we can't afford anything right now, so we're, gonna, we're just going to move in together. And she let her parents just kind of wide-eyed. And she goes, actually, um, none of that's true. I got a D, though, in chemistry, and just think, Mom and Dad, it could have been a lot worse, right? It could have been a lot worse. So, ha, 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 ha. Play the laugh track right there. Okay, no, it could have been a lot. She was, thank God for what what didn't happen. In other words, um, maybe you missed your goals at work and you didn't get the bonus, but you still have a job. Thank God that you still have a job. Maybe you got in a car wreck, a fender bender. It was with an expensive car, you know, the other car, but at least, right, at least nobody was hurt. At least, in other words, it's thank God for what didn't happen. Um, thank God for the bigger picture of, of what is positive in, in the situation. Okay, so um, <laughs> thank God for what didn't happen. So we need to think about that, how we react to the situation. Second thing is this practice pre-framing. Practice pre-framing. Again, our thoughts or frames shape what we experience. The thoughts 
our thoughts, our, the way we frame things will shape what we experience. If we say it's going to be hard, if, if I want to do another Spartan race this summer and like, oh my God, like eight miles, 13 miles, <laughs> I, uh, uh, right? No, I, I could say, you know what? It, it's going to be hard. And I wonder, or I could say, it's going to be fun. I'm going to love the challenge. And at the end of the day, I'm going to be better for it. And I know it's not going to be easy, but I'm up for it, right? It's pre-framing. Um, you could say, ah, oh, I can't stand going to visit so-and-so's house, right? Or so-and-so, or, 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 or going to whatever event, you know, a birthday party or a wedding or, or whatever. You're like, ah, I hate weddings. We just sit around and watch people. Like, No, or you could say, you know what? I, I want to see the family. If anything, we get to see the family, right? If anything, we get to spend time with the family. There's different ways to pre-frame what you are going to, uh, to, to encounter. Um, one of the things that, uh, I've learned over the years is to pre-frame knowing that when the pressure comes, uh, I can still push through and I could figure a way to find a solution, figure out a way to find a solution. And it's always those of you who know me, like you know that even when we went through this pandemic, let's figure out a way to be online. Let's figure out a way to keep moving church. Let's figure out a way to do it. Like I'm the figure out boy, right? That may be my, my superhero strength. I don't know. But I wasn't always like that. And, and one of the ways that I learned to pre-frame things is uh, years ago, I had a, a really close friend um, by the name of Jake, and we used to work out together. And, and, and Tangie, if you're watching, you would know um, you introduced me to him, and, and he ended up dying uh, in a motorcycle accident. And it was, it was just instant. It was, it was crazy. It was crazy for that this, this happened. And um, I remember being at the funeral, and, and his, the parents asked me to do the funeral. And I remember being there, um, and, I, and I called uh, my, my, one of my supervisors, my spiritual leader, Sam Rockwell. I called him, and, uh, and I said, Sam, I, I don't want to be here right now. Like, I, I don't, I don't want to do this. I just, I just want to go cry with my friends. I just want to be with them. I don't want to be the person in charge. I don't want to be the person that has to be in front of everybody. And, uh, and Sam said, people like them need people like you in these situations. I believe in you. And I know you can do it. And, and, and that was one of the key moments that I remember in my life where I had this reframing. That when situations were tough, when emotions were high, when time was limited, when things seemed like they were going to end, there was a way to stay strong and for me to push through. And I knew that God called me. God called me to, to be the strong person in these situations. And it's not that I have all the answers. It's not that I even have the best answers. In most cases, I probably have a bad, the, uh, there probably is a hundred different ways to do this better. But the point being is that God instilled this pre-framing into my heart to pre-frame whatever difficult situation we're in or is coming to understand to start thinking of solutions right away to get ahead of it to get ahead of it to kind of predict what's going to happen to pre-frame this might not go right so before i get to this conversation i'm going to rec i'm going to remember that i got to approach this relationship with love i've got to approach this conversation with understanding this may be difficult but i i know that i've got to do it for this reason this reason and this reason and i've got to ask god to help me moving into this situation pre-framing so we thank god for what didn't happen and we pre-frame it. The last thing I want you to do, the third thing is this. Look for God's goodness. Look for God's goodness. Um, you're going to find what you're looking for. Evie always says this. She said this when I met her. You'll find what you're looking for, right? And I said, well, I found you, right? I was looking for it. Um, no, you'll find what you're looking for. Uh, I have a photo here of a vulture and a hummingbird. And the vulture is always going to be looking for things that are dead, right? If anybody knows anything about vultures, you look for the things that are dead. And the hummingbird, though, on the other hand, looks for things that are sweet, right? And, and tasty. And, and uh, how many have a sweet tooth, right? So you, uh, the vulture is going to look for dead things. 
Hummingbird's going to look for sweet things. Which one are you? Like you're going to find what you're looking for. You will find what you're looking for. If you want to see the bad in a situation, you're going to find the bad in the situation. You're going to find the negative. You're going to find the challenges. You're going to find a reason to not finish, right? If you're going to try instead of train, (laughs) you're going to find a reason to give up. If you're going to think ahead of time that I can't, you probably won't. But if you want to see the good, and even if it seems impossible, and even if at the end of the day it seems like there's no way out of this, you could still say, I'm going to learn something from this difficult situation. I'm going to learn something that I didn't know before. I'm going to get stronger as a result of it. I'm going to be better for it. And there's an opportunity for growth in me and through me because of it. It's all in how you see it. You want to see bad, you're going to, you're going to find bad. If you want to see good, you're going to find good. So look for God's goodness in everything. One of the people that I look up to, and I always think about this when this person prays, is, is Pastor Bethel, my good friend Bethel, one of my closest friends. And he, uh, when you hear him pray, he says a prayer. He, he prays beautifully, by the way. And, and again, it's just, it's just from the heart, and that's what God wants. But he always says this. He says, God, we thank you for the good and the bad. He says that all the time. And it's almost a pre-framing of what could or couldn't happen or what may or may not happen. It's setting himself up to deal with whatever's going to happen. God, thank you for the good things, because we know there are good things that are going to happen to your children for those who love you, right? And thank you for the bad things, because we know that we live in a broken world and bad things might happen. And I thank you because we could learn something. We'll grow from it. We'll cry through it. We'll be better for it. We'll be stronger as a result of it. I love that. So this idea that God wants us to cognitively reframe, (laughs) a cognitive reframing um, to lead us in the direction of uh, the most positive outcome. You know, uh, we could have easily said, and I heard so many people uh, over the last year say, man, 2020 was horrible. 2020 was, 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 <laughs> was bad. We didn't do anything. The church, just, nobody wants to come to church and blah, blah, blah. Nobody wants, and, and all of this, all of these things that, that I heard. Um, and yeah, there were some, of course there were challenges, but we have to reframe it. You know, I, I didn't want to get laid off. I was like, what is going on? It was, it was scary. I didn't want the church to close. We had to close it. Everything that I'd love to do just shut down overnight. But in that process, we had more time with my family, right? We had time to learn more. We had time to figure out how to do church online. We had time to, to look at these switchers and watch. I said, do, do a couple of different angles real quick, like the big picture, the close picture, the side picture over here, right? Are you showing me? I don't know. I can't tell. Okay, right? Like we figured it out. We figured out how to do an amazing stream and to be able to do this at a high level, to continue to honor God, to get the word of God out. We learned all of that. We got a chance to do some things together, to go on hikes and to spend more time on weekends than we ever spent before and memories that we'll cherish forever. We got to do our own photo shoot, right? <laughs> it, was, it was amazing. It was amazing. We know that God works everything out for the good. And we're going to reject unhealthy default frames that say that, that we're a loser, that we're never going to win, that we're never going to be smart, that we're never going to uh, push through, we're never going to advance. And we're going to reframe the circumstance of not in a passive receiving circumstance, but an active, right? Actively interpreting that God, you're in control. You're going to work things out. You're going to do this for your good to glorify your name. And we're not going to interpret, we're not interpreting God through the circumstance. Listen to me. We're not interpreting God through the circumstance. We're interpreting my circumstances through God, the goodness of God. 
We're not interpreting, God, what are you doing in this circumstance? What's going on with you, God, in this circumstance? No, we're taking this circumstance and we're, and, and we're interpreting that this circumstance, God is in control in the middle of it and I believe in him and he's going to see me through. Paul said, what has happened to me actually served to advance the gospel. You can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you frame it. Church, let's pray. Lord, we come before you, Father. And we're so thankful, Lord, that we get a chance, Lord, to spend an hour each Sunday together um, loving you, serving you, learning about you, growing in you, and experiencing you, Father. And so I pray, Lord, that you would um, renew our minds, Father, as Scripture says. And Lord, for those that are here, and, and if you may, you may be listening to this, and you don't have a relationship with God, you've never prayed to God before, or you don't, you feel, you don't feel good enough, but you know you need something more, God sent Jesus the Savior of the world, the perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world, to come be born of the Virgin Mary, to live a perfect life, and to ultimately die for the sins of the world so that you, me, we all can make be right with God and have our sins forgiven. And if you've never accepted Christ into your heart, I want to invite you to do that now, just saying this simple prayer, Dear Lord, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I need you to be my savior. Come into my heart. Save me. Make me brand new. My heart is no longer mine, but yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Eternal Rock, can we give God a clap offering now? Let's go ahead and sing one last song as we finish service today.